All right, so let's go ahead and start, start talking about crayfish a little bit. But before we do that, we're going to go ahead and i got to introduce myself a little bit. Um, I work for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. If you're not familiar with that, that is the, the state government agency that's responsible for managing the wildlife in the state. Um, I, I do like to point out at this point that um, even though we're a government agency, we are actually run more like a business than we are a, a government agency. We take no state ta taxpayer dollars. Um, we're a user-based system. So like our license fees and, and, and things like that is actually what goes and funds um, the, the, the work that we do. Um, so we don't take the, the, the taxpayer dollars. So we're in a little bit different boat than, than many of the government agencies. Um, myself, um, that's that's me obviously, and, and I am the a wildlife education coordinator for the department. Um, I was, I'm was i a former middle school science teacher as well as social studies teacher. I did that for uh, almost six years prior to taking this position, which I've now been in for, for just over six years now. Um, and in that position, I although I do go into classrooms occasionally, um, we actually have another individual, our outreach coordinator, who is primarily responsible for going into the classrooms. I do a few classroom outreach, but most of my position is working, I like to say, behind the scenes a little bit. I work um, often with teachers and, and educators and, and working on, on getting wildlife and wildlife issues into the classroom in, in curriculum development and teacher workshops just like this. Um, I also run our homeschool program, which which I believe aimed April um, has, has been through part of that as well. Um, just sort of you know getting um, some of our homeschoolers and some of the other members of the public out into the field to interact with wildlife or interact with our biologists in, in some way. So that's kind of where I'm coming from in my background. So let's go ahead and, and, and get started a little bit. But before we dive into the crayfish, our, our guess, our, I guess our guest of honor today, um, we're going to talk about invasive species in general to get started. And to do that, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So we're going to talk about um, a few vocabulary words here, and I want to make sure that um, we all are sort of using the same definitions. And, and in particular, we're looking at native species, non-native species, and invasive species. Depending on who you ask, they may classify non-natives and invasives as the same thing. We are going to designate them slightly different today. Um, but let's start with native species. Just in, in your text chat, really quickly, can anybody come up with a, a, a decent definition for what it means to be a native species? What do we mean when we talk about native species? Okay, species that were here first, before the bio invaders, many before us humans. Um, good, that's species unique to the area. Um, good, let's go ahead and, and pop up what I have here. Um, all right, so. What I'm doing, and what I should say is, is we should acknowledge that each of these terms, um, there is no one right answer. Uh, scientists still struggle with the perfect definition for these, just like it, just like many of our, our things. There's always going to be exceptions. There's going to be people that take a different take on it. But in general, um, for native species, what we are talking about is an organism that occurs naturally in an area. Um, typically, we define that as being there before humans were. Um, that's that's where it sometimes gets in gets into a little bit of a change. It's often said that these species evolved in that area. They they evolved to the habitat, the conditions of that habitat, um, and then that's good um, and is relevant when we, in particular, when we talk about invasive species. Uh, but what about non-native? What do we mean when we talk about non-native species? Any thoughts? Um, Minnie is giving some examples of some species that could be classified as non-natives. Absolutely. Um, they are, Natalie actually gives probably a pretty good definition is that they are from somewhere else, but they're not necessarily destructive to that area. Let's go ahead and bring up what, what I went ahead and put down here. An organism that originates in one location is an, imported to a new location. I, I, so a plant or animal that's been brought in typically by humans from someplace else, they often are referred to as, as introduced, exotic, non-indigenous, some of those terms that you see right up there. Often these are not threats to the area, or if they are, they can at least be adequately managed so that to minimize those impacts to them. So they are a little bit different than what we see when we typically refer to as invasive species. Um, and actually, Linda, you are giving some other examples of how species can be transferred. Man, uh, obviously, man is the, is the main way, or humans is the main way that, that we're going to talk about today. But they can get spread by a number of other features. They can either even be, um, we call them hitchhikers, basically, and they can just um, hitch on to animals. They can they can get past in the weather. They can cross the oceans. All sorts of different things that, that could happen um, purely by accident. Um, even when humans bring them in, it's often by accident. Um, so what do we mean by invasive species? What is an invasive species? Based on how we've defined it, um, the other two definitions, native and non-native, what would invasive be? Harmful to native? Absolutely. They are species that makes the native compete um, 
native compete for food and they're they're destructive absolutely so let's go ahead and throw out my definition that i that i'm putting out the non-native species that they are they are non-native species that outcompete native species we often call them nauseous or, or nuisance species it, the, the big issue there is that they outcompete these species that have basically been that are adapted to survive in this habitat these guys are almost overly adapted they don't have any natural predators often and so they don't have anything that's that's actually controlling them naturally in a pop in in a ecosystem and so they have that opportunity sometimes their breeding cycles are different um, when we look at fish often we actually see that fish some of our invasive fish actually breed earlier in the season than some of our native fish and so that actually causes them when they're growing up they actually eat the babies of the native fish so it causes that the native fish issues with with reproducing often a lot they usually have a dramatic effect on the ecosystem either the native species or the ecosystem as a whole we will notice that when i described invasives um, I defined it as non-native species, but I often get asked, is it possible or ca can a native species be invasive? Any thoughts? Sarah thinks so. Linda? Okay. Okay, so me and, yep, okay, good. So absolutely, we actually have this question, and I think depending on who you ask, it's, you're going to get a different answer. So I use non-native because that's particularly what we're, that's what we're most interested in, is those that aren't supposed to be here and are causing destruction. But I would imagine there are certainly going to be some examples of some native species that could be invasive, although it's hard to argue that they are invading if they're native. But, but, but certainly, they could have that dramatic impact on the habitat. And, and Stacy mentions coyotes, and certainly we are seeing coyotes that, are re-establishing territories that, across the country. Um, but for our arguments today, we're going to consider um, invasive species right now to be non-native, just because that's kind of what we're talking about in general. But that would also make a really good question for to address students. You know, have students think about it, maybe do some research, and maybe write a persuasive paper on it, on whether or not it's possible for a native species to be invasive or not. Okay. Good. So now that we sort of define those definitions, obviously our focus is going to be on invasive species. And, and before we jump immediately to the crayfish, let's take a look at some of those. I put on this slide a number of, of invasive species right here in Arizona that we've acknowledged. And this is just some of them. And we actually have a better poster now that you'll have access to. Um, and these are, uh, you'll see a collection of plants and animals as well as terrestrial and aquatic on here. Um, starting up in the upper left-hand corner there, you'll see buffalo grass or fountain grass. Um, very, very common in this area now, has taken over many of our desert um, and, and is out competing much of the of our native grasses they were brought in here a lot of times for erosion control as well as for just landscaping people put that in their front yards um, and then of course the wind picks up their seeds and they take off and they start growing out in the wild and, and they can out compete um, is becoming highly destructive and you've got groups like this um, Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum down in Tucson and some other places that are are adamantly working to, to get these out uh, as much as possible um, of course, then you have up in the up in the middle middle top there, you have that little green blob there. That's actually golden algae. You'll start hearing more about this. And if you've been paying attention, at least in Arizona at all, over the last few years, occasionally you might see a story on the news about how a lake has closed periodically because of a golden algae occurrence or a golden algae bloom. Um, they are in a number of our lakes, including most of the Salt River systems. Um, I don't believe Roosevelt Lake, of all places, does not have it currently that we know of. But the other two lakes along the, the, the Salt River system do have um, golden algae. And the issue is it, it's it's there. It, it came, we know Texas has been hit pretty hard by golden algae. It's in many of our waterways. Some of our urban lakes have them as well. I think an urban lake out in Gilbert ha has been struck by it a few times. Um, and as Minnie is talking about, yes, they, they actually are, are changing the water chemistry of the water. But under most circumstances, the golden algae are in the water and they're perfectly fine. They, they don't have any issues. The problem is that there are these, the, there are these instances and they usually happen periodically. Uh, maybe once a year, maybe once every couple years, where all of a sudden we see this massive fish die off and this massive fish kill. And for a while, we didn't know what it was. And then we found out that golden algae is the cause. They actually cause the um, start that the fish have trouble breathing. It affects their gills and comes in there and they, they can't breathe and they can't, they can't circulate the oxygen and go through. So it kills the fish. But it only happens during these times that we call algae blooms. So the, the algae live most of the time perfectly out there. They don't affect the fish. And then something happens in the water. And this is actually what we're still trying to research. We don't know what causes an algae bloom. And we've been doing some research over the last few years trying to, to control that or see what causes it and see if there's management strategy we can do to help the fish a little bit. It is going to have some kind of environmental cause, absolutely many, but we're just don't, we just haven't identified what specifically that is. If it's temperature related, if, if there's other things that come into it, it's probably going to be a variety of factors. But something triggers this and they start basically... They, they have this bloom and they bleed out, not bleed out, and just they, they, they basically 
put the stuff out in the water and that's what causes the fish to basically die and it causes them trouble breathing and so you see that periodically and sometimes in the news you'll actually see that pop up that this gold that the lake has been closed because of a, gold, a golden algae bloom and that's an issue that we're dealing with certainly from a, a management perspective from game and fish a lot of these fish that are being impacted are sport fish people that are paying money for licenses to go fish and eat these fish and they can't catch them um, so it, it's a monetary issue from our perspective but just in general um, next to that one you have the zebra mussel or the quagga mussel the Quagga mussels just recently came into into Arizona, um, probably in the last couple years. And this you're going to hear more about. This will probably be our next big deal right here in Arizona. This is slowly spreading its way through our lakes. It's been working along the Colorado River system until recently we um, ended up with um, them in Lake Pleasant. And now we're trying to stop them from going to different lakes. And they, they get spread because they, they're on people's boats. They get attached to the boats, actually, or they get in the water of the boat that the person doesn't clean very well, takes that boat to another lake, and actually spreads it. This is the quagga mussel, Q-U-A-G-G-A, -G -G -A, Sarah. Um, it's got a close cousin, the zebra mussel. They're sort of referred to together. I believe this picture is of zebra mussels. But we have the quagga mussel, but they're, they're really, really close relatives of each other. Um, and they're about the size of probably um, your, your, your thumbnail is about as big as they get but they're going to be huge first of all from from a from an ecological system that they, they are they they eliminate the base of the food chain they are filter feeders so they eliminate all the plankton and all the other stuff that's in the water and since they reproduce like crazy and they have lots of them they actually remove that whole lower level of, of the of the of the food chain which of course affects all the fish that uh, that are on there but uh, aside from that they cause other damage they actually um, I'm forgetting the term now but they actually do stick to any hard surface um, and they, that's that's basically where, where they get attached. So that could be boats. That could be um, that could be anything that's in the water. Boat rudders. So it's actually causing an issue for recreationists as it attaches to their rudders and they turn it on and it breaks their rudders or their or their things. The other issue we're facing is it actually clogs pipes. And so, of course, since most of our dams here are used not only for recreational purposes, but actually for water and electricity, um, that, that affects two things. They fill up the pipes, and so that, that it clogs the pipes, just like if you're having a heart attack and you get that cholesterol buildup, and it makes it less able to get through the pipes so they can get in there. The other issue it's causing is it actually gets in, in to, and attaches to the turbines and makes it different for, difficult for the turbines to spin, which could affect electrical generation. The cost of, of, of maintaining these facilities for things like SRP and APS as well as game and fish is probably most likely going to cause our electricity and water costs to rise in the in the next few years um, just for the cost that's associated with with trying to control these guys and clean these guys off of some of these things and so that's one of the issues that that, that we're facing with quagga mussels um, there's going to be certain fish certainly some bass and, and some things like that that are going to eat mussels nat naturally that we wouldn't even have to introduce the problem is that there's so many of them and they reproduce so quickly and they're so hard to get because during that during their larval stage they're basically just this little floating thing in the water they're incredibly difficult to control while you can see them as adults you can't really see them as, as a young and that's what's going to be an issue and then below that of course you have the New Zealand mud snail this is not an uh, obviously New Zealand it's not a native native snail but it's out competing a lot of our local snails here and this one's kind of interesting because what it does is it, you know it can reproduce faster it's pretty voracious has a, has a pretty big appetite but the other thing that it does is when a predator comes against it this is uniquely evolved that it's actually got a little flap that covers the opening there and so when it's eaten by a bird or a fish or some other natural predator that might eat this thing it actually closes that flap and gets sent all the way through the through the digestive system and and passes all the way through without being eaten um, and so that affects obviously if they outcompete the other mussels that those fish are relying on or those birds are relying on and then the birds go and eat these they're not getting any nutritional value and they're also not really being impacted so it's kind of crazy and it's an interesting one as well down below you see the bullfrog in the lower right hand corner it's obvious that that's just like crayfish very voracious having a ma major impact on our, our native amphibians and things like that in the middle there at the bottom you see salt cedar i'll get to the beetle next right here mini in just a second salt cedar or tamarisk um this is a, a plant that was put in for a variety of reasons for um erosion control it actually um is out competing a lot of our cottonwoods now and has, and has changed a lot of our our, our the habitats are the riparian ecosystems. It also changes the fire regime. A few years ago, last year, the year before, we had the, the Ethan fire, which is out near Goodyear a couple year, um, a year or so ago. And that was actually burned on, on the Indian, the Gila River Indian Reservation and burned out all the salt cedar, but caused massive fire. The problem is that the salt cedar grow back very quickly. So the fire didn't take them out like it would normally um, take out a lot of our other trees. And they just came back and they're coming back in, in, in stronger force. That They're just a problem. But the other issue we're facing with salt cedar is there actually have been some endangered 
endangered birds like the southwestern willow flycatcher that are actually using the salt cedar for homes now. So now we've got this interesting dichotomy of we have an invasive species, but it's now become a home for an endangered species. Um, and so how do we manage correctly around that? Of course, that beetle that you see, that that's actually the, the bark beetle. Um, which we hear a little bit about, and we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about it in just a minute. But that's the one that, that's getting in the in the, the trees, and actually, um, if it's not killing the trees themselves, it's actually weakening the trees to the point where they're starting to die. It's actually is what, what we're seeing now is it's actually killed off about two to three percent of the forests in Arizona um, as a, as a result of of uh, bark beetle infestation. And of course, in the lower left hand corner is the guy that we're going to talk about in just a minute, and that is the crayfish. Arizona is one of the few states, if not the only state, that has no native species of crayfish. There are no crayfish naturally occurring in Arizona. Um, we do now have two crayfish that we've been able to identify with potentially a third one that's on its way that are found now in Arizona that are, that are invasive, the northern crayfish and the red swamp crayfish. But let's real quickly go through some of the, the impacts that invasive species have. Um, these are some numbers I pulled. I, I, pr I actually produced this presentation a while ago, so some of these numbers may not even be completely accurate now. You can see that there are about 50,000 invasives that establish themselves in the U.S. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are all from outside the U.S. They may be species that occurred somewhere else in, the, in one place in the U.S. and have invaded another area. Area. But but there are 50,000 invasives that have established, costing us over $100 billion annually um, in agricultural loss, tourism, recreation. But that cost does not include some of the indirect costs, like what it, the environmental losses and, and what it would cost to put those back, and even some of the human health issues, as you'll see in some of this. And it is the second most serious threat to biodiversity behind habitat loss and fragmentation. And really, what we're finding now is really the only way to do anything is to stop them from getting there in the first place. Once they've established in an area, they are incredibly difficult to get rid of. And so our management strategies change dramatically. We almost have to live with them as opposed to trying to get rid of them. In some cases, there's ways to get rid of them, but, but the way, because of our ecosystems being so connected to each other, they're incredibly difficult to get rid of. Let's look at that. In, in, you know, bird species. Ten percent of our birds in the United States are introduced. They are not from here. The majority, the majority of those can cause damage to property. They can spread disease, et cetera, et cetera. One of those, most notable, being the pigeon. Pigeon or rock dove is not native to Arizona, not native to, to much of, of of what we talk about. The pigeons themselves carry fifty known diseases just to humans, and it costs over a billion dollars a year to control those. Mammals, of course, we have rats, and everybody's heard stories of rats and, and how they spread quite easily. They get on boats, and, and, and you know, they, they're going to eat some of the, the grains and some of the food. Feral cats, feral dogs, we see some of the issues they have. Feral cats obviously affecting the biodiversity out there. They're actually eating the birds, and not necessarily costly, but then the dogs um, and the hunting of, of livestock, and not to mention that the injuries they may cause to humans. We have feral pigs. Hawaii is being greatly affected by feral pigs. Mollusks, we already talked about the zebra mussel and the quagga mussel. You can see right there, $5 billion per year. year. Um, so $5 billion a year to control and, and repair um, the damage caused by zebra mussels and quagga mussels. We would be insane to think that that companies like APS and SRP are going to take that cost and not pass them on to the consumers that are using that electricity. That's that's some of the things that we are worried about. Um, and as you can see, by 2020, they are expected to be in most fresh waters in the, in the country. Um, we've had horrible luck trying to stop them in Arizona. Um, we have been able to stop a few um, that we've been able to catch, but you know it, it's just a matter of time before it, it's so difficult to monitor every boat that goes in the water and every person that, that goes in the water. Um, so yeah, we're expecting that most freshwater bodies will have these zebra mussels, these quagga mussels by 2020. Arthropods, you can see there's a lot of those. We didn't talk about red, red imported fire ants, but those are those are one of the big ones in Arizona as well, and the damage they cause. And of course, bark beetles. Some areas of Arizona have lost 90% of their trees as a result of, of bark beetles. All right, so this is a little um, thing that I pulled out, which would be a fun way to introduce the concept to students or actually as a review with students as well. Um, I just put a little picture here, and we're talking about aquatic invasives. So those species that live in the water, crayfish would be one of those. Some There's some plants that, that, that would be some of those as well. And just take a look at this picture, and can you just find... There's at least seven, I think there might be a few more in here, but at least seven ways that aquatic invasives may spread. Can you identify from this little cartoon here? And just talk about, you know, throw them out there, the boat. Some, you know, Minnie says the boat absolutely could spread it. We've talked about that with the quaggas. Releasing the pet fish there in the lower right-hand corner, there's that kid throwing his fish back in there. Certainly anything involving people is probably going to spread it. 
so the, the trash dumping the unused bait absolutely and these are common ways that we've seen right here in arizona so just there there's a little answer thing that they provide here um you can see the scuba diver um he actually um if you look at his scuba bag in the lower left hand corner he was in africa and he was in all these other countries and so if he didn't clean that suit it's possible that he was spreading something from one of those to, it could be a seed that got attached to it the duck hunter with those little um models he's using the the um, the, he, the, the little fake duck he's using that's putting out there if he's putting that in repeated waters of course releasing the pet fish and this is incredibly important for for teachers as well when you consider classroom pets and this we think has been one of the issues in arizona and actually there's research out of washington now showing that crayfish are spreading largely now in that state as a result of golf courses and classroom pets and then of course we have the, the the unused bait and that was a big one crayfish are often used as live bait and so people have a big bucket full of them and when they're done fishing at the end they'll actually throw them in the water they think that they're doing good and they don't mean harm by this they think that it's water i'm going to release this water animal so they can go back and live and that that's bad and what we find here and, and we'll, we'll go ahead and talk about the law one of the laws related to, to crayfish right now in arizona it is absolutely illegal and i think we, we were the first state to do this and we may currently be the only state that is this strict it is absolutely illegal to transport live crayfish anywhere in the state except there's a small portion right around yuma that that is that is that's legal to do this but in all the rest of the state for all intents and purposes you cannot transport live crayfish what that means is a teacher is if you had you wanted to use live crayfish in your classroom which there are some FOSS kits the structures of life FOSS kit that actually requires you to use live crayfish if you called up a biological supply house like by Bi um, Carolina biological or Niles biological and you asked them hey I need some live crayfish for this box they cannot ship them to you they would actually be breaking the law which is also the reason why you cannot go into pet stores at least the big ones I'm sure there's some mom and pops out there that aren't aware but if you go into Petco or PetSmart you will not find crayfish in Arizona in their tanks you cannot buy them it's absolutely legal to ship them into the state and it is absolutely legal to transport them that also means that if you catch crayfish in the wild in arizona you're perfectly fine on catching them it's absolutely legal you do need a fishing license but once you have a fishing license it's an unlimited take you can take out as many crayfish as you want there's no bag limit but if you capture them they must basically be killed on site or put on ice you cannot take them keep them alive and transport them back to your classroom that is illegal you also can't take them obviously to another water source they have to if you catch them you could put them back in the water you found once you catch it like let's say you caught it accidentally and you put it back in the water i would just encourage you not to do that just go ahead and kill it and there are humane ways to, to kill it and we'll talk about that and actually some of the 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 um the workshops that i do out in the field we actually show you how to do that but it's absolutely legal to transport live crayfish in arizona um, we encourage you to if you're camping for example to you know set out some traps and we're going to talk about some of the traps that we have that you can actually borrow from us and capture some crayfish and then cook them right there at your campsite absolutely have a barbecue or have a have a crayfish boil right there at your campsite it's a food source that you can use let's go now and talk about our, our set our guest of honor i suppose crayfish and this is an activity that, that you'll be able to download at the end um, that i have it's a lesson that we developed called the trouble with crayfish and it starts basically with these two pictures you would show these pictures to your students you could put them up on an overhead projector you could hand them out at handles and you have two pictures okay and you have one on the left hand and one on the right hand can anybody sort of briefly describe what are some differences that you notice between these two pictures just go ahead and jot down some ideas about some observations that you make about how these picture these two pictures are different from each other I'm going to interpret some of the things that you're saying. The right side looks a little dirtier. It looks less clear. Um, the, on the left side, it looks very, very clear. We see that there seems to be a lot less plant life on the right-hand side. You can see that there are plants actually, there, there's some plants that are actually in the water. You know, there's obviously the plants on the banks, but in the water, there are some plants that are growing that we don't necessarily see as much of in the, in the right-hand picture. There seems to be a little less movement in the right-hand side. Now, that could just be the person that's standing in the water could have affected that, obviously. But, but certainly, there, we're, we're trying to portray that there's less movement. And then, of course, so, so if you were introducing the students, you wouldn't have already introduced crayfish. You basically put these pictures up and you ask the students to compare and contrast the two different pictures. And then what you tell them is that you say, okay, these pictures were taken at the exact same stream, um, probably about a half a mile from each other. Same day, about a half a mile from each other. And then so you ask, okay, why? What would explain the difference between these two 
between these two ponds and, and then between these two this is the same stream it's actually a three fork stream over in the over near the white mountains in arizona and what we see of course is what we try to get them to is that the right hand side we're, we're at this point in the stream on the right hand side had been invaded by crayfish and we had no evidence of crayfish on the left hand side and that's for all intents and purposes the only difference with the exception of these places being separated by by about a, a half a mile or so so this introduces just visually the impact that crayfish could potentially have on an ecosystem now of course when i do um, when I'm not doing an online workshop and I take teachers out into the field, we actually try to show you some of this stuff. What crayfish do, their basic biology, to give you an idea. One, they burrow. They burrow into the ground and so that they, they dig up the dirt and so they automatically are, are, are the water more dirty, I guess is what I should say, not the dirt watery. Um, they're making the more, they're putting more of that dirt in and into the water, which might just sound, okay, well, they're just making muddy water. And, and yes or no, but that actually does affect the fish's ability to breathe. If you want to do a really cool experiment, and we do this with students sometimes as well, is get a, a big tub of water. Um, and you could do this for, I would get like four or five kids in a, four kids in a group and, and each table, each group would get a tub of water and, and have the kids give them straws. You have to, there's a lot of rules you have to go through with these kids to not get them in trouble. But it, we do this at a summer camp with some kids and have them blow as hard as they can into that, into that water. And then they make bubbles and, and it's really cool. Um, and then what you do is you start adding stuff into the water. You say, okay, this is, was a nice pristine stream. Well, let's add some rocks because most streams have some rocks. So you have them add some rocks into the stream and then let it settle for a little bit and then have them do the same thing have them blow as hard as they can and they're going to form some bubbles obviously then start adding some more stuff add a little bit more dirt okay after a while as you start adding more and more dirt what the kids are going to find and i didn't believe this until i actually did it with the kids what they're going to find is after a while they're actually going to have a hard time blowing bubbles the, their face will get all red as they're trying to blow bubbles it becomes really really difficult for them to blow bubbles so what we're illustrating with that is the more stuff you put inside particularly that dirt that you put inside the water and is flowing around the water actually makes it harder for for oxygen and air to circulate through the water so it's actually putting less oxygen in the water so the fish can't breathe as much because remember they need that oxygen circulating through the water so that they can actually extract that oxygen using their gills but if the, if the water, if the air can't flow into the water, can't can't get in there because of all the stuff that's in the water, um, then the fish can't breathe as easy. So it's, it's a really neat illustration, a really neat um, demonstration to do in the class um, just to show the impact that that could have and why the dirty water, it's not just about being dirty, it's about actually affecting oxygen cycling in the, in the water. Crayfish are also tremendously voracious. One, they reproduce like crazy. They have lots and lots of babies at a time. And you'll actually, in just a minute here, you'll see some baby, some pic pictures of babies that sort of surprised us a little bit. They have lots of babies at a time. They can reproduce multiple times throughout, throughout the year, although they do tend to have an uh, April or May type reproductive period. But they can reproduce multiple times throughout the year. And they eat anything. They are the epitome of the omnivore. They can eat plants. And they will eat the shoreside plants. And they'll clear out the plants on the shoreside. They'll clear out the plants on the inside of the water that are, that are growing there. But they will also eat the animals. They will eat the frogs, the little frogs, if necessary. We have a picture it's not in the powerpoint unfortunately but we actually have a picture of a crayfish that has a snake in its claw now is it going to necessarily eat that snake not necessarily it might grab it, it might cause some injury but you i mean they can catch larger animals um, and they will eat what they can they will even eat each other if it came down to it they they are cannibalistic and will eat each other and they get incredibly territorial um, which we're actually trying to find ways to use against them or actually find ways to, to use that to control them you know they also eat the frog eggs they eat the fish eggs they, and so that they're affecting a lot of our native amphibians and native fish which of course most of them are endangered most of our native fish and native amphibians are endangered so any impact that that's going to have on them is is going to be massive so crayfish are a huge issue in Arizona just by their basic biology. And we're trying to experiment with ways to control them. But just to give you an idea of how bad they can be when we talk about the reproduction, I have a little picture here that I'm going to show you. And what I want you to do in this next picture is try to count as quickly as you can the number of crayfish that you see in this picture. Now, I'm going to tell you that this picture was taken as probably about a meter by a meter square when we look at this to give you a scaling size. So just real quickly, count the number of crayfish and do, do this that you see in this picture. And then post up some guesses. How many crayfish you think are in this picture? Again, we're talking about an area that's probably roughly the size of a meter by a meter. Obviously, it's a picture, so it's not going to be fully to scale. I have a guess of about 35. Somebody says way too many to count. 75. Um, let's make it just a little easier. I'm going to show you one more picture here. And we're just going to point out all the crayfish. Okay. Every place you see an arrow is another crayfish that's in this picture. 
Okay. So while they are territory, and I believe I, I actually forgot to get the count. I, I count it all the time, and then I forget the number. I think the number's right around 67, but I'd have to go through and, and count that. It's a seven in there somewhere. It's 67 or 87. I, I think it's 67. Um, I think I could be wrong, but so actually, um, Natalie was pretty close with 75. There's a number of crayfish in this picture. They are territorial, but they can clearly be in an area. And, and so if you have that many crayfish, it's not going to be a lot of hope for the native fish and the amphibians and stuff like that, that are, that are trying to get around them. And again, this is another cool, like this, these pictures you can just show to students and, and have them try to guess and figure it out and what that could mean. Um, we are trying to use some of that territorialness um, against them. One of our hypotheses that, that's being tested is that um, although they're territorial, it tends to be the the dominant male that is the one that, that does most of the reproducing. And so our thought is if we can actually identify the dominant male in an ecosystem, and that's the challenge is identifying the dominant one. It's usually the biggest one. But if you can actually capture the dominant male, you don't want to remove it because actually when you remove the dominant male, you actually cause an increase in the population as the other males work to become the new dominant one. But you you, t you capture the dominant male and you actually sterilize the dominant male. You can actually remove its ability to reproduce and put it back in the water. We may have some success with controlling the population because he can't reproduce, but he's not going to let the other males reproduce um, and so we think that that might have a difference but of course it's 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 we're working at it and good job many you were able to to pretty much guess that we're also experimenting there's a, there's a research at asu who wants is looking at ways to perhaps introduce a fungus and we always hesitate when we introduce something new to take out something that we've introduced but th there's this claim that this fungus it, it's it's in a state it's, it's almost like a, a pill that you would drop into the water and in that state it causes no harm and is completely inactive but when the when the crayfish eat it they die there's some thought that maybe we could we could drop a bunch of these fungus pills basically in the water. The fung the crayfish would eat them, and they 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 seem to be species specific. It's a special fungus that's species specific. I don't know if it's been genetically engineered, um, but maybe we can control it that way. Unfortunately, the way we deal with some of these non-native aquatic species is sometimes through poisoning. And what we'll do is we'll actually go in and remove all the things that we're interested in, like the native fish, the native frogs, all that stuff. We'll take out all the animals that we 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 want to be in there, and then we'll send a poison or something down the water, which I know sounds horrible, but but, but sometimes it's the only way we can do some of these things. Poison all the, the non-native stuff that we don't want. And then once that poison has a chance to clear and, and get out, then we put all the native guys back in the water. That doesn't work for crayfish because what happens is the crayfish can sense that difference in the chemical distribution of the water and they actually burrow into the sand and they get away from it and they wait till it passes through and then they climb back out. So even when you, when you try it, a lot of our common techniques don't often work with crayfish. Now, what I want to do is what, what we do with students a lot and just show you a little bit about what we do. And this is an example. The, the, the material you see here are all available for you to check out. If you're in Arizona, um, these are all available for you to check out from one of our, our, our Game and Fish offices. These are called our crayfish capture trunks. And in it, they provide the buckets, the poles, the nets, the traps, all the stuff that you need. If you wanted to take a group of scouts out, if you wanted to take a group of your students out, if you were at a park and you wanted you wanted to look at crayfish, I know there's crayfish at Lake Pleasant um, that they might be a little harder to capture, but you could certainly do that. So we've actually taken teachers out, we've taken students out, but we actually take you out in the field, we talk about crayfish just like you're seeing here, and then we take you out and we actually try to capture some crayfish. So we'll go through really quickly the steps and we do that. Now crayfish are incredibly easy to capture, but they're just incredibly difficult to take to control. I mean, you can catch them with anything. There are people that, that just put hot dogs on the end of, on a fishing line and they can capture them. I caught a crayfish accidentally with a marshmallow one time. Um, we use these, these traps called umbrella traps, which you can see there in the bottom right, in the bottom picture there. It's just a trap that, that has a, a fishing bobber on the top of it. When you drop it in the water, it spreads out. If you bait it, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, we, you put some bait at the bottom of Just use a twist tie and tie it to the bottom. We often use chicken wings. And this is a great activity. One night if you're camping or before you go camping, just eat a bunch of ch eat the chicken wings. Make that your meal, your dinner for the night before, and just save all the bones. Sometimes leave a little bit of the meat or the fat on it. Just save those, throw them in a bag, and the next day, use that as your bait for your crayfish. You can also use hot dogs. You can also use cat food, especially that they, they really like that canned cat food. If you just open up a, a tiny corner of it and let that scent get out in the water. But tie off the, the bait to the bottom of this trap. You can set the trap. You can see that the, the girl, the girls there in the in the upper right hand corner, they're using a special hook pole that we've designed, and it's basically a piece of PVC pipe with um, a tent stake that's been taped to the end of it that gives a little hook that you can use to um, set the traps out in the water. You like to set them there as opposed to throw them out there because we've had some of our participants in the past have just thrown the traps in the water and then they've realized they couldn't reach them. 
they threw them a little too far from where they could, could get them. So it's nice when you set them out with the hook pull because you know that you can reach it. And you just let it sit there. This is what we would call, we call we actually call this active trapping as opposed to another technique that I don't have pictures of, but we do include the equipment for you called passive trapping. And when, with that technique, all we do is you have a, you have this big box-like trap. It's called a minnow trap. And it's basically a box, a, a, a mesh box with openings on both sides. And you put the bait inside and the crayfish can climb inside, but they can't get out. And that type of trap you just set out, for example, you'd set that out at night, and the next morning you would wake up and you would see what's in your trap. Hopefully it's just crayfish. Sometimes you capture a lot of other things like frogs and fish and snakes and things like that. And we actually tell you how to set those so that, that you don't cause problems with some of those. Um, but that's passive trapping. You're not actually doing anything. You set the trap out, and the trap does all the work. In this case, this is what we call active trapping. You set the trap out, and you would actually line up a lot, you know, four or five or six of these traps in the box. You're going to get about 12 of these traps that you would check out from us, again, for absolutely free. And you place them along the stream or along the, the, the river or the, the lake or wherever it is that you are, and you and you you just lay a number of these out. By the time you've laid out four or five or six of them, often if you return to the first one, you've already got crayfish coming up into the trap. And then you start pulling them out. We'll talk about that in a minute. This is a great opportunity when you're with students to start building in some inquiry activities as well, getting them to do real science. What what we started doing, what, what you realize is that, so you start asking kids, okay, where would you most likely be finding crayfish? Would you find it in shady areas? Would you find it in, in the sunlit areas? Would you find it in moving water, slow moving water, stagnant water? And the kids could actually use their traps and place them in a variety of settings and actually collect data on where they're collecting crayfish more. So it's an opportunity where you can use these traps to actually guide some inquiry activities and they can learn perhaps a little bit about the crayfish biology that's going on a little bit. Um, so these traps though, so you can lay them out, you can have the students actually place them in areas of their choosing um, and they can run, they can collect data on which one, which areas collected more. They could learn a little bit about biology that, that would continue on and allow them to, to go through, you know, studying a little bit about the biology of the crayfish while they're out in the field doing something, which is another thing that we're trying to do. And so you let the traps go out there. Eventually what you'll start to see is you'll start to see your bait start to move. The crayfish are grabbing at the bait and they'll, they'll affect it. So then you got to try to get them. So that leads to our next step here. What you do is you get one, this is where the teamwork comes in. You'll get one person who's going to grab that, use that hook pole that I described earlier and grab the top of that trap right by the, the bobber. And the other person is going to get the big net and the, and the co collaborate and coordinate on this. And they're going to count like three, for example. And the person with the hook pole is going to pull straight up on that trap. So she's going to pull it straight out of the water and the person with the net is going to get right out from underneath it. And the reason you do that is because the holes that are in the, in the umbrella trap are often large enough for some of the bigger ones to pass right through. So you want to try to capture any that, that might come flying through there a little bit. And they'll drop right into the net. Once you get them in the net, you can drop them right into a bucket of water that you have. And then you can that trap is basically ready to go back in the water. You know, the bait's still going to be there more than likely because you've twist tied it down. Um, and it's going to continue in there while you collect these, these crayfish and, and you just continue throwing them in your bucket until you're ready to go. Once you've done that, and this is the other cool part, again, we're trying to get students engaged in science, and this is, this, is, this is one example of some of the citizen science projects that the Game and Fish has. We are actually collecting data on those crayfish that you're collecting. Not only are we interested in getting rid of the crayfish, but we want to know a little bit about their population demographics. Because if we can know, are there more females or males? Are there ju mostly juveniles in a particular area? Are they mostly adults? Then that can tell us, that can allow us a little bit of predictive predictability about what that population might do in the future. Um, and, and might educate us a little bit or inform us a little bit about the control methods we might need to do. And this is all in that box that you're provided. We give you the buckets. We give you the, the rulers. We give you even the data sheet that you see in the lower left-hand corner. And what you're going to do with every crayfish that you capture, you know, if you don't capture too many. Now, I've been out in the field where we've captured literally two or 3,000, and we've just sort of generalized them because after a certain point, the, the data becomes basically useless. You get too much data. But what you're going to do is you're going to collect the sex of every crayfish, and we're going to tell you in just a minute how you can sex the crayfish and determine whether they are male or female. And then um, you're going to measure it. Okay, because that's so, so we're going to learn the sex, male or female, and then the measuring is going to give us a rough idea of its, of its age classification, if it's a juvenile or if it's an adult, um, based on its size. Um, and so you can see that. Here are some teachers that are actually doing that right now. And so how do we do these things? First of all, how do we measure it? When we measure, at least, you know, when you're collecting data, though, it's important that everybody's using the same technique, the same, the same um, procedure. And so for our purposes, we just measure the carapace. So we don't worry about the tail. 
And there's a variety of reasons for that. They can lose tail segments and, and things like that. Tail isn't going to give you isn't going to give you an accurate thing. So we use the carapace, and you can see the carapace there is basically right between the eyes to basically that back part of their shell. So you're going to measure that part. We measure in millimeters. So on that data sheet, there's going to be a box for you to write in millimeters. So you're going to write in 15 or 7 or 32 or 54 or whatever it is based on that. And then once you've done that, you sex it. And this is how we tell them apart. Okay. We try to show you an illustration as much as possible. On the female, on the left-hand side, you see a female, and on the right-hand side, you see a male. Once you've done this a few times, it becomes very, very easy to tell. Eventually, sometimes on the really, really small ones, it's a little bit more difficult. But basically, the, the difference is that the males have an extra set of legs, uh, these small, like, swimmerette-type legs that come up and fold up right, among the, right along the middle there. The females don't have that set of legs and instead have that hole or that port. Um, obviously, as you can guess, those are, those are two... Um, genetic, um, those are two factors used for reproduction. And so that's the difference between them. And so it's very, very quick to collect the data on these species. You can have numbers of students doing them at the same time. You print out multiple versions of those data sheets, and you just have groups of students collecting. All They can collect the data on the crayfish they collected. You can put them together in one large group and just have people collecting as much data as they can. Um, they, they measure and they get the sex of every crayfish that they capture. Once they've done that, you can s submit the information to us, and we'll actually putting it into a, a GIS database, a Geographic Information System database, that hopefully in the very near future is actually going to be available to the public, where you'll be able to go to anywhere in the state of Arizona on this map and push it, you know, push where you're interested in going, and you'll be able to get some information about the crayfish populations in that area. That is our hope in the very, very near future. So you'll be able to actually see if there are, there are crayfish that we've seen there, or we haven't collected crayfish in that area, because there are a few places in Arizona that are not infected with crayfish yet. And of course, then if you do happen to see some out there, then you would report them to us and it helps us monitor them a little bit. And many of these boxes that, that you can see, and we'll talk about where to get them in just a minute, but they're available at any of our Game and Fish offices. Um, you can actually check them out. They're absolutely free to anybody to use, not just teachers. Um, we have a number of people that go out there. So if you are going to go camping, they, they are a decent-sized box because you can see all the gear that's included with them. But you can take them out um, with your kids. You can take them out with students. You can take them out with scout groups. Um, any number of people that, that, that can do that with. We're not checking who it is. We just ask that you, know, you, you use it. Obviously, we do ask you to clean those materials when they're done. Um, the, the only two things that are not provided in the box for you is the bait that you're going to use and the bleach that you would use to clean it. But the box itself is used as a big container that you can make a bleach solution and you can clean everything in the container that it's provided with. We've tried to make it as user-friendly as possible. And that's, again, important because we're talking about how we spread invasive species with that with those cartoons that we looked at at the beginning one of the ways is if we use this gear in an area that was infected with invasive species we want to make sure it gets cleaned and taken care of before we place it into another um, lake or stream or anything like that completely in a different part of the state and that's the issue with these crayfish boxes is somebody that's going to Roosevelt Lake might use them today and then next week they're going to be used by somebody going down to the San Pedro River and then the next week they're going to be used by somebody going over to Trace Rios and all that spreading we don't want to be spreading not just the crayfish but maybe there's an invasive plant that got stuck on the net we want to make sure all that stuff gets cleaned out so the bleach solution actually kills most things and then we actually ask people if you leave the stuff out in the sun for about a day the UV will actually kill most anything that's on there as well so those two steps will usually kill anything that's on those nets and then they can be used in future as well. So that's just one of the things that we do. But we also encourage you in these workshops that you could go to as, as a teacher as well, you could actually go out there and we tell you how to quickly kill these guys to cause the least amount of harm to the crayfish and make them usable for food if you wanted to. We actually have a technique you could certainly, I know somebody said you could squash them and usually with the little ones, that's usually what we encourage. But we actually um, encourage you to, after you've done the data collection to just start preparing them to be eaten so you can have actually somebody cooking up the food, which isn't much, you just start boiling water basically um, you can get some some crab boil or some lobster boil or something like that at the at the grocery store um, and throw that in there it's usually a bag of seasonings that just literally gets thrown in and floats in the water and spreads the season around while it's boiling maybe get some potatoes maybe get some corn or anything like that that you might eat with them you could boil those in with the crayfish just in the same bucket of water and then what you do we found the easiest thing to do is remove the tails some people actually will will eat what's called the tamale which is actually the whole crayfish um, and you actually suck out the insides the brain and the heart and all that stuff that's in there I'm not a fan of that. I think it's gross. I think it's disgusting. I think it... But if you're a fan of that, that's fine. You could throw the whole crayfish in the water. And, and usually we, we will prepare a few of those for the people that are, that, are, that are brave enough to try that. But most of what we cook up is just the tails. And it's just like a lobster tail. You actually remove the tail. We actually go through the technique of removing it. First thing you want to do is devein it. 
Um, and there's two ways to do that. I've been told that you can just throw the crayfish in a large amount of salt water because crayfish are largely freshwater. And what they will do is they will evacuate their system on their own. They'll basically go to the bathroom because th their digestive system runs through their tail there. And so you want to get rid of all that stuff. And so if you throw them in salt water, they will supposedly evacuate their system. We haven't had a lot of luck. Me and the biologists who have done this, we literally poured a whole thing of, sh of salt into this thing of water past the point where it was where it was overflowing with salt, wasn't dissolving anymore, it was super saturated solution, and they weren't doing anything. They were walking around perfectly fine. Shows you again that adaptability is crayfish to survive to just about anything. We found that the, the easiest way is just to pull that digestive tract right out. And actually, if you look on in this picture on the left-hand side where it says female, where she's got, where that person's got her hands, she spread out the telson. Now, the telson is the tail of, of the crayfish. And they've got five fins on their telson or their tail. There's two on the right hand, two on the left hand, there's one in the middle. We found that actually if you just grab that middle one just by itself and you twist it, to, to break it away from the shell and pull it out, it's actually attached to the digestive system, and so the digestive tract will come out with it if you do it correctly. And so that's a really quick and easy way to, to pull that digestive system out, and then you can actually twist the crayfish right at the base of, it, of its carapace where you're measuring, and the tail will rip off separately. You just throw the tail in the water and boil it up. And then the head, we've actually found that the head, you know, if, if you're again, if you're interested in recycling, you're not going to eat the head. You can actually just throw the head out into the forest or wherever you are because the raccoons will eat it. The birds will eat it. It will get used as a food source. And at that point, they're not really going to going to cause any harm because um, you've essentially essentially killed them at that point. But you boil it up. It literally just takes a few minutes. As soon as that tail turns a bright red, as soon as that tail turns a bright red, it's ready to eat. Um, and you can season it with butter or however you want to do it. I'm sure Minnie's got all sorts of recipes of, of how you can cook up these things. But there's an alternative. Let's say you don't want to eat it. And I fully understand. Again, I am not a fan of these. I've, I've, I've eaten them at a few of the workshops we've done. I just don't like them. I, one, I think it's a lot of work for the, for the little amount of meat that you get out of them. But if you don't want to do that, the other alternative... The alternative is take all the crayfish that you've collected the data on, throw them in a big cooler with ice, throw some more ice on top of them, and that's it. Just be done with it, um, close the cooler, put it in your car, and then take it to a wildlife rehabilitation center. We've got one over um, in North Phoenix. You can take them to places like Liberty Wildlife. You can call the Phoenix Zoo up or any of these places up. Uh, Obviously, let them know ahead of time. Don't just show up with a big bucket of crayfish. Uh, Phoenix Herpetological, the Reptile Society, they will often take ones. You can't transfer them alive, Minnie, was, was a trait. They can be dead, and you can transfer them. You can't transfer them alive. That's why they have to be on ice when you do this. You can't just leave them in the water. So, yes, kill them first. And, and we're recommending, again, if you don't want to go through the process of ripping their tails off in that process, because that, that does bother some people, and we understand that. Put them on ice. That essentially kills them. And that make sure you have enough ice, one thing of ice in there, one block of ice, probably, you know, get a couple bags of ice and throw it in there. Um, put them in your car and drive them to one of those places. That that actually serves as a, as a nice treat for some of these animals. You know, Adobe Mountain, which is our wildlife rehabilitation center for, for the game and fish, we have herons and occasionally we get raccoons in and things like that. And this is almost a treat for them. It's a little bit of a difference from, the, from their normal diet. Sometimes it serves as enrichment food. So it's a special treat for them. And so the, often these zoos and many of these places will, will, will love to have these donations in there. So it's another way you can work with your students on, especially scout groups like to do this, it's another way that you're giving back to wildlife. Not only are you helping control the invasive species, but you're also helping some of our native wildlife that are having issues with feeding. You're helping them because most of these places are nonprofits, and so they, they have to pay for their own food, and so they appreciate any donations that, that you can get them. Um, again, contact them ahead of time. Don't just show up with a big bucket full of frozen crayfish because, you know, it tends to, although they might appreciate it, they have to find something to do with it and they might not be prepared for it and, and things like that. But they always appreciate those types of things. The one thing I want to make clear to you guys, and, and this is the issue that we have, is, is and we're finding this is, this is a, a change we're seeing in the population, and this is where this education like this comes in handy, especially from the teacher's perspective. There's a lot, of, you know, with the animal rights movement and things like that, which, which is perfectly fine, and I really appreciate these movements. The the issue is that it's come down to causing harm to any animal is bad, and that's the mindset that many people have. And what we need to do is we need to change that, that mindset to some extent. We don't want to cause needless harm to animals, and we don't want to torture them or anything like that. But there are some species that do, or some animals out there that do need to for a lack of a better word, do need to be taken care of and, and, and dead. If the crayfish are not controlled, the problem is that they are killing our native species. So if we don't do something about the crayfish, we are actually harming other species. Crayfish are perfectly fine animals in the ecosystems that they belong in. In places like New Orleans, they're perfectly fine. Okay? 
But just like Minnie says, we have to kill the crayfish to save all the others. And that's the issue we face. Now, that doesn't mean that that justifies people going and playing baseball with the with the bodies of the crayfish. I mean, we, we still want to treat them humanely and, and treat them respectfully, you know, and, and appreciate what the kid, you know, allow the kids to understand that there's a purpose for doing this. And these are very specific species that we're doing this for. But that's why I like the idea of using them again, either for food or donating them for the animals as well, because it's a little bit easier for some people to, um, for lack of a better word, to swallow. It, it allows them to understand that if this isn't taken care of, then we're causing problems for our other animals that, that need to be here. So Natalie asked what keeps the crayfish under control in, in their native environments. That's a good question. They're, they're going to have native predators. And even here in Arizona, we are finding that crayfish actually do have predators. There are herons that come through. In fact, in Rio Salado in downtown Phoenix, um, which is, if you haven't been to Rio Salado, I encourage you to check it out. There's there's an Audubon Center on the south side of the river. It's at Central and the Salt River, basically, just out, <clears throat> um, just south of the I-17 um, if you're in the Phoenix area, but on the south side of the river, there's a new Audubon, a nature, an Audubon nature center there. On the north side is where the city of Phoenix has a lot of their parks and 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 stuff like that. And there's hiking trails throughout there, or actually walking trails, I should say. But it goes along the river, and they've rebuilt the river and tried to get it back to what it might have looked like before it became a dump, basically. But there are crayfish there. Um, and for a while there, the city of Phoenix didn't want us to capture the crayfish, and didn't want us to control the crayfish because they were actually serving as a food source for the migratory birds. And what Rio Salado was pumping up is that they they can see over 200 birds a year there, 200 different species of birds a year. And that's a big deal when you're talking about it. This is a, this is an urban Phoenix, right in downtown Phoenix. And you're getting an area because it's got the water that's attracting over 200 species of birds. And that's cool and really neat for those schools that are down there to be able to go on field trips to this area or the people that live down there because um, it is in a low socioeconomic area. People that typically don't get outside you know, because they don't have access to nature and here's something in their backyard. But at the same time, so, so the, they didn't want us to go in and capture the crayfish because they were a food source. So they are a food source for animals. The problem is that they evolved and they grew up and, and they lived in their native environments. And so the controls are much there. There's fish that are used to eating them. There's their, their reproductive cycle ties in with the other reproductive cycles of the plants and animals that are in there. Um, so they're under control. And, and by control, and many can probably say, there's still a lot of them. It's not like they're endangered in New Orleans or anything like that. I mean, they still are, they reproduce like crazy and, and, and you know, there, there's a lot of them there. But they do have these natural predators that, that, are, that are taking there. The problem is, in Arizona, they don't have a lot of those. Yes, we do have some predators, but the predators aren't on the scale that... That they because the crayfish weren't here. There's no other animal that's really designed to go directly for it. That the, the habitat isn't designed for it. You know that the plants, the plants even that, that are going to be found in some of these areas are going to be designed and, and adapted to live with the crayfish. So they're going to have different technologies. We see the same thing in the desert when we look at the impact that wild horses and burros have had on some of our native plants. Cows and horses, or burros and horses, are that they graze and that they eat plant they eat the grasses and the plants just like the deer and the elk do or the deer is probably the better example but the problem is that they, they graze very differently the way that they eat their their mouth structure is very different and so when a deer eats it actually eats the plant in a way where the plant can actually grow back but when the a wild horse or burrow eats it because of the way one it stay it tends to stay in an area longer so it actually will will take out much more of the plants but even their mouth structure is designed differently that when they bite the plant they actually kill it essentially when they bite it um, or cause a lot more harm it has a lot more difficulty regrowing and, and probably the same is true with the crayfish is that the plants aren't really adapted for what the crayfish can do to it and so they can come in there and ravage a community and, and the plants don't know how to survive and the same thing is going to be so in new orleans or those types of places or where the crayfish are native they're going to have plants that are used to that so they've adapted with the crayfish and we don't see that here in arizona it's kind of a long answer for um a, a very quick question but but it was a good question nonetheless so as I mentioned, once you've collected the data, of course, the next step is to eat it. And there is an example of our crayfish boil right from our workshop. And you can see we cook up the potatoes and the, and the, and the corn, and then you can see the crayfish tails right there. And they're a big bright red. Um, and you just use a fork and you pull out the meat from right inside. And we actually have this available at our workshops if we catch enough crayfish. There's always an issue of you know the areas we choose, what we have found. And this is something that I'd like to do with, with students um, or some of you guys that are in the parks. It would be really curious to, I'm trying to model crayfish populations for an area. We go to the same place every year. And some years we'll get in there and we will literally over three visits, we will catch over 3,000 or 4,000 crayfish. And then we'll come back the same time next year and we will catch 20 crayfish over the course of three days. 
And obviously some of it has to do with the amount of rain that we got and how much flooding went through there. But I think it'd be re a really cool longitudinal study for students to adopt a park or adopt a, a river or stream if they happen to be near it. And every year go out there and collect crayfish and keep that data and keep recording it. And over time we can pr and monitor other things, monitor weather patterns and all that type of stuff. I mean, you could design a really cool experiment if you were the teacher or if you were the park ranger at an area and wanted to bring student groups out to do this. You could probably collect a lot of data on this and start monitoring and start seeing, do we notice trends in what causes p crayfish populations to spike or what causes them to drop? Can that give us a predictability factor? You know, if we see a certain amount of rain, are we going to expect a certain amount of crayfish the following summer those types of things would be really cool and i think that'd be a really cool student experiment uh, student experiment to start running and generating through the years if you had that ability and you could go to the same place every year i think it would be really fascinating so if we capture enough crayfish we do boil them up usually it ends up being a taste test we provide enough corn and potatoes for people to eat but usually it ends up being a taste test while you go out and when you take students out it's not just about the crayfish yeah we want to get those crayfish out and we want them to collect data and we want them to learn experiments but they're going to see a lot of other cool stuff when they go out there i'm going to show you some pictures of just some of the other stuff that we've seen just you know in just one or two trips out to, to go look at the crayfish here's a picture of some of the other species that you see of course you're going to see dragonflies we saw a tarantula one time one of the best times to catch crayfish is at night they are more nocturnal than they are diurnal so you can catch them a lot easier at night um, so you get to see the tarantulas. You can see a funnel spider there in the upper right-hand corner. We've seen butterflies, of course. Occasionally you see some other stuff. That, that turtle in the middle is a Sonoran mud turtle. We go out to a place called Spur Cross. And they actually have Sonoran mud turtles. Now, Sonoran mud turtles are extremely important to our ecosystems, and, and they actually want to track them every time they see Sonoran mud turtles. And so every time we see one, we, we try to let the, the spur cross managers know, hey, we, we notice a, 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 a Sonoran mud turtle. We mark its location with GPS and we let them know where it is because they have a suspicion. What they've been finding over recent years is they have not found any baby Sonoran mud turtles. They have only found adults. And that wasn't always the case. Probably about 10 years ago, they would find a good diversity of them. Now they're only finding adults. Now, obviously, if a population is just made up of adults, we can predict what's going to happen to that population. That after time, if they're not reproducing, that population is going to die out. And so the hypothesis, many as you predicted, is that perhaps the crayfish are making a difference. So we've been actually going into Supercross every year for the last three or four years, trying to make an impact on the crayfish population. And, and, and you know, we're not going to notice a difference. We keep taking out the same amount of crayfish every year. But maybe we're making a difference where we can, we can give the turtles enough of a chance to survive again and, and give them sort of extra help. Those eggs need to develop. One of the hypotheses is that perhaps the crayfish are eating the babies or eating the young. Um, and that's why we're not seeing any baby um, turtles. There could be other reasons, but we don't know until we start trying. Of course, you see the javelina that was at the same place, out of Spur Cross. We did, we did come across a javelina. And then we came across the, the red-spotted toad that you see there in the middle. And then the, the, the tadpole you see, as well as the frog that's right next to it, is a leopard frog. Now, this is an example of, of an area that we have, we did have tadpoles right next to crayfish. So they're not eating all the tadpoles. Some tadpoles are surviving and they're turning into frogs, but we are seeing a lot less of them. Um, but these are all things that you can see while you're out doing the crayfish. So not only are you, can you go out and take kids out and, and, and do something good for the environment and try to make an impact with the crayfish, but you can learn about the ecosystem as a whole when you're out there. Now, sometimes we get a little surprise. This is a crayfish. We were doing crayfish trapping at Rose Canyon Lake in Tucson on, on Mount Lemon. This is a crayfish that, interestingly, had buried itself in a, in a can. Somebody had dropped a can, just like a soup can, in the water, and the crayfish was living in that soup can. Okay? And we pulled it out, and we flipped it over to sex it, and we saw those white things. You can see the, the pile of them under the legs, and then if you look further back towards the tail, you can actually see some more. Those are the baby crayfish. This was a mother. And what, the cray, what they do is that they lay the eggs and they, they will actually store the eggs under their tail. So that she'll actually fold up, the, the eggs will lay and she'll put them on her tail and curl them up under her tail. And then when those eggs hatch, she'll do the same thing. She'll hold those babies curled up under her tail until they get big enough to find. And so we didn't see all of them at first. So we, 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 we got a picture of it. It was kind of cool. And you can see those. At this point, they were crayfish. We had caught another one that had the eggs. But then we threw it in the water. And we, were, you know, we didn't notice it at first. We threw it in the water. And all of a sudden, these things just flew out from underneath. I mean, all of a sudden, one crayfish turned into all these little things flying out from it. And it was really kind of cool. It's kind of like if anybody's um, got a spider or scorpion that was carrying babies. And you squish that one. And all of a sudden, the babies just sort of took off. Same thing kind of happened. We put this in the water. And all these 
babies sort of sort of swam out. So we picked it up and we had a whole bunch more. So sometimes you get really cool surprises. Not only are you surprised by some of the other wildlife you see, but you get to see some of the other stuff just with the crayfish themselves. But it is kind of cool, provided a unique opportunity. They could see how many babies. This was just in one set. This little, this one mother could produce. And you could start seeing the problems. Now, we've only seen that one time, but you do get that occasionally. It's really kind of cool. Now, we didn't, we don't ask you to um, sex and measure all those little babies. We just sort of, um, that's kind of impossible at that point. You wouldn't be able to do any of those things. But it is kind of a, a cool little experience. So crayfish are nasty little buggers that we don't want around. Now, the sad part about it is that there's probably not a lot we can do about it. We're going to educate people. We're going to continue to educate about why we don't want crayfish and why we don't want invasive species in general and how you can do your part. You can go out into nature and try to collect them. But you're still going to have the issue that because they're basically out competing us at this point, they, have, they, have the, the, they are adapted for survival. Interestingly, you want to talk again about how well these creatures are adapted. They are gill breathers. They have gills. If you were to dissect them or if you've ever done a dissection with them, they do have gills. But what we found is they can actually survive a, a, a decent amount of time above ground. We have an instance where we had a crayfish that was in an ice. We had crayfish that were in an isolated pond. There was no way in. It was one of these like cattle tanks. There was no way in, no way out. We found another crayfish at another isolated pond that was over a mile away from the first one. Um, there was no other crayfish within a mile, no other sources of crayfish within a mile. And so we, we think that that actually migrated there on, the, on their own. Can't be certain of that. Somebody could have taken them there. But we have actually seen them travel, at, especially at night when it's cooler and it's a little more moist. They can actually get out of the water and they will actually walk. Okay? And it's really kind of creepy. When we were doing that night one where we saw the tarantula, we looked down, we were having trouble actually catching crayfish. I do say that they're easier to catch at night, but we were actually having trouble. We looked down, and going across our shoe was the first crayfish we caught of the, day, of the night. It was just walking right across our shoe. It had gotten right out of the water. And so that they can travel at night. They can travel... It, they can, they can, as long as it's sort of cool enough and moist enough where they're not going to bake and they're not going to cook, they can get to another water source. So basically in Arizona, what we're looking at is if it's a closed system, meaning that there is like, it's a cattle tank. If there is no inlet or outlet, it is likely possible to control crayfish, but you have to go in there. You have to capture every single crayfish that's in there and perhaps continue to go back once a year and do that. In an open system like a stream or a lake or anything where there's another source of water coming in, it's likely impossible for us to control. So once they are in an open system like a lake or a stream, it's going to be incredibly difficult for us to get them out of that system because just because you clear them out of one area and if you're going camping, you're going to go into an area and you might capture three or 4,000 in a couple hours. All they're going to do is just move into that area from another part of the stream. So it is incredibly difficult to get rid of crayfish. But we can still do our part. We can learn what we can. Um, I know Minnie's talked about funding occasionally. If we can have some funding, perhaps we can we can explore different solutions. But really, it comes down to understanding their population as much as possible, which is where the, where the data comes into. No water source. If, if it's connected to a source that has crayfish, it's not going to remain crayfish-free for very long. Um, that the, those pictures I showed you at the beginning, which were half a mile apart with crayfish in one and, and not in the other, it's likely that we got it at a unique time. And if we went back to that same area, there's probably crayfish in that area. It's a sad story, but we can do what we can. We can learn what we can. We can help where we can. So, so you are doing good. You can go out there in the field. You can collect them. And then you can either eat them, which gives you some essentially some free food, or you can donate them. Now, again, I will remind you, just a, a, a reminder of the laws that are associated with it. You do need a fishing license to take crayfish. Now, people often ask, well, if we want to get rid of them, why do we require a fishing license? Two reasons for that. One is because fishing licenses do fund what we do. Um, and so it's nice if people are going to go out there that they actually try to support the cause a little bit. And so the, but once you have a fishing license, it's an unlimited take. The other reason is by requiring a fishing license, it also sort of establishes that we have authority to regulate it. There would be some, you know, we are a government agency, so we're open to politics, unfortunately. Um, there would be some that would say, hey, if, you, if, if it's not part of your fishing thing, then clearly you must not care about it. And so what, what right do you have to create regulations about it? Um, so there would be some that would argue that, that we would have a hard time regulating it if we, didn't require, if we didn't have it as part of our things that needed a fishing license for. And so we do require a fishing license for, but by that fishing license, once you have it, though, it's an unlimited take. It's not like other fish 
that there's only, you can only take six at a time or whatever. Now I do want to point out some other resources and where you're going to be able to get some stuff. We have some resources available to you right from Arizona Game and Fish. We have a poster that's available to you. Um, Crayfish Ug and Yum brochure, which talks about how to cook them and things like that, is a, is a PDF brochure you can have access to. We have another one called Backyard Ponds and Invasive Species brochure. So these are all things that you can download for free. We have two YouTube videos that we have on there. One is called Crawfish in Arizona. I think that that's one that talks about our, our program where we've taken some kids out and then we have one on the, the Camp Verde crawfish cookout every year up in Camp Verde. And I forget the exact time frame on it. They have a big crawfish thing that, that many might be success, might, might be familiar with. I mean, they literally bring in thousands and thousands of pounds of crayfish. And it's a big festival they have over a weekend. And it's just this massive crawfish thing. And they bring out the, the, the music and all that type of stuff that you can do. And it's centered around this big crawfish thing. And it's in, it's in Camp Verde every year. Um, and it's supposed to be a lot of fun. I unfortunately haven't been there yet, but um, that's a whole, if you want to get a feel for that type of thing. Some other resources that are available to you. These are some activities that we've put out there. Um, the Trouble with Crayfish Lesson Plan, which is what I talked about. That would show those two pictures of before and after streams, as well as some things that, that your kids can do with the, with the, if you're familiar with Project Wild, we took an activity that's really, really, even if you're not familiar with Project Wild, you're probably familiar with the, um, the Oh Deer activity in which kids pretend to be deer. And then you have other, other people are habitat components and the, the, the deer eat the habitat and all this stuff. Well, we've, we've modified that to be for crayfish. And so your people become fish and then a crayfish infestation occurs. And so we've modified that activity that's in that lesson plan that you can download it's for free um, we do talk about crayfish in the in the classroom um, which is what you need so I've mentioned the, the legal aspects around crayfish is that you cannot transport live crayfish. Now, that was a problem for for schools that had that curriculum, that FOSS kit we talked about. They had adopted this this, this FOSS curriculum, and, and they got mad at us because we, we weren't allowing them to get the crayfish. We have made exceptions. Certain School districts can now apply for a responsible use plan. If they go through this, and this is all in that crayfish in the classroom, if they go through this right procedure and they can verify that these crayfish will not be returned to the to the wild, we will let we will give them specific permission to allow them to either get their own crayfish in the wild or get them sent to them from some of the biological supply houses. It is a process they have to go through, but that's the compromise that we've made. So there is a process for schools to be able to get access to this. So many districts already have that ability. So if you start teaching in a district, see if they have these permits. Um, they do have to renew them every year. The crayfish capture resource trunks are available. I have an article that I published in our magazine that's, all, that's also online. It's called Educating with Mud Bugs. We have a podcast. We, we stopped doing these podcasts, but we do have a podcast on invasive species. If you go to that link and then scroll down until you get to episode 10, you'll not only get the podcast, but you'll get some resources we made available with it. We have these activity sheets that are different grade levels. They're a little dated. They're a little old, but they're focused on non-native species that you could download for your appropriate grade level. Again, absolutely free. And of course, if you missed anything and you don't want to listen to this, or, or again, you can always contact me. There's my information. The easiest way to contact me is probably by email, but, but that depends. Thank you, guys.